very mightily. And it came to pass because of the midwives, uh, because the midwives fear God, that he made them houses, that is, founders of families. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife uh, to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. So she saw him, and then she hid him. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what should be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark, and here's our lesson title, among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. God made Egypt pay for the care of his mother. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he, that is Moses, the child, became her, that is Pharaoh's daughter's son. And she called his name Moses, which means drawn out. She called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Now, to begin with, we need to understand this word flags, F-L-A-G-S, here in the King James Bible. If we hear the word flags today, we think about 4th of July, the American flag, or something like that. But this is not talking about a flag that uh, you can raise up on a flagpole. This is talking about a weed, W-E-E-D. Flags are nothing more than reeds or weeds. If you will look at Isaiah chapter 19 and verse number 6, we will see the phrase that establishes this. Isaiah 19 and verse number 6. And they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. Now listen to this phrase. The reeds, R-E-E-D-S, and flags shall wither. So you see the, the definition of the word flags. It is, it is coupled here with the word reeds. So that's what it is. It's the reeds that grow up in a marshy environment. It is that which is uh, like they use the papyra uh, to make, uh, they wrote on that and they used it, she used it here to weave an ark uh, for the salvation of her son. Let me show you something else in Exodus chapter 10 and verse number 19. Let me show you this word, flags. It is the Hebrew word that is translated flags here in Exodus 2, 5. In Exodus 10 and verse number 19, And the Lord turned a mighty strong west uh, wind, which took away the locust, and cast them into 
Now these next two words is the exact same Hebrew word flags and cast them into the Red Sea. You mean to tell me that the word flags in Hebrew is the same word the red for the Red Sea? Yes, that's exactly right. I found that strange too. But what I began to see was this word red just lacks one more E to read the read C. And that's what some of the Hebrews called it, the read C. The word red and flags, that is the bull rushes, uh, they are one and the same word. So it is, he cast them into the read C. So it's an unusual word. Uh, what, these words are unusual to us. I never ever heard the word red, as in red sea, described as the reed sea in all of my years of Christianity. It was never taught me. It's not in my King James Bible. But as I look it up and begin to study this word flags, I begin to see that it's the same Hebrew word. So we begin to see some things here about this. In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 22, the place where Pharaoh told everybody to cast these newborn males, Hebrew males, was into the river. So the place where the flags are on the marshes there near the Nile River it was, first of all, seen as the place of execution. He says in Exodus 1.22, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So this was the place where Pharaoh, a picture of Satan, a picture of the beast, a picture of one who is in opposition to God's raised up son that was raised up in this thread of death. Moses, a picture of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Luke chapter 24, the Lord Jesus tells us how we are to look at the scriptures. He says in Luke 24 and verse number 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory and to enter into his glory? So there's two things that Christ brought up about himself that the whole entirety of the Old Testament scriptures set forth. Number one, the suffering of Christ, the cross. Number two, the glory of Christ, his crown. So he says everything in the Old Testament speaks of that. And then in the next verse, he begins to show us the individuality of various uh, people, personalities, and so forth that are in the scriptures that speak only of him. In Luke 24 and verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, listen, the things concerning himself. We're not just reading a history lesson about Pharaoh and the midwives and Moses' mom and daddy and the, uh, his sister going get it, getting his mama and that sort of thing. What we're reading about is a revelation of the person of Christ and what shall happen to him. In all the prophets, it speaks of his suffering and his glory. And we're going to see that as Pharaoh represents the person of Satan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Moses, the deliverer, represents the person of Christ. So he says in also in verse number uh, 44 of Luke 24, when he is there with them in the upper room, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms 
And again, as in verse 27, he says, concerning me. Everything in the prophets, everything in the Psalms, everything in the law of Moses concerning, concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Having said that and made them to see the purpose of the scriptures, the next verse says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Dear soul, to be able to understand the scriptures, we must be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ in every character, in every historical event, in every color, in every fabric, in everything that is said and done. It's all about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, he speaks again concerning our relationship to the scriptures. John 5, 39, search the scriptures. You are to study and search the scriptures. But what does he say we are to search for? Well, you have to be careful about what you're taught in religion. He said, be careful for in them ye think ye have eternal life. You think eternal life is in memorizing the scriptures or complying with the letter. But the Bible says of itself, the letter of the law killeth. It's the spirit of the word that maketh alive. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But here he says, and they are they which testify of me. That's three times the Lord Jesus Christ has said the scriptures concern himself. Luke 24, 27, Luke 24, 44, and John chapter 5 and verse 39. And all three times, they are the written word and record of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, who fulfills that description? The Word who is with God, the Word who is God, becomes flesh and dwells among men. Can't be anybody other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. For He was with God before the foundation of the world. The Pro Proverbs chapter 8 clearly tells us as it speaks about wisdom. And Jesus Christ is said in 1 Corinthians to be our wisdom. And in Proverbs chapter 8, we read of his eternality and his being with God. It says in Proverbs 8, in verse Number 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. This word Lord is all four capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The almighty God, J Jehovah God, the, the great I am. He possessed me in the beginning of his way. As long as there was the father you can't be a father without having a son. As long as God the Father existed, the Son existed in him. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, I was brought forth when there was no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills were, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. This is the eternal Son of God 
saying, as long as God the Father was, I was with him. I was by him. I was as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Where was God before the creation of the world? Where was God before in the beginning God created? He was in his glory. How do you uh, understand God prior to creation being in his glory? He was there with his son. For Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and the Father are one. So he said to one of his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So we understand and see in John chapter 1 and verse number 14, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, listen, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So to look upon Christ was to look upon God. He says in John chapter 14, in verse number 1, he tells us, Let not your heart be troubled. What is it that he wants to comfort our hearts with? You believe in God? You believe in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? You believe in the God of the Old Testament prophets? He said, well, believe also in me. In the same way that the old patriarchs believed in God, the I Am, we can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ it is one and the same thing. So your hearts are not to be troubled in that we see John weeping in Revelation chapter 5, knowing that the old things had passed away. The uh, temple veil was split in two, thus polluting the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. The law was at an end. Uh, sacrifices was over with. Jesus Christ had come to fulfill the sacrifice once and for all, and had done that which no other sacrifice or all the sacrifices put together could ever accomplish, and that is to bring satisfaction to God. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The greatest word in the, in the entire Old Testament. God is satisfied with his people because Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness so we come to see then that when we look at characters in the bible we can't just make anything out of them we want to but we should not fail to see the person of the lord jesus christ shining forth through them so we understand and see then that when moses was brought into the world there was already a death threat upon him before he was born Pharaoh, representing Satan, had already set up a place uh, of execution. It was in the river. It says, every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. So there was that which was established because of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So before Moses was born, there was death reigning. Brother uh, Tommy this morning has brought forth a wonderful devotion and read us in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans that through one man death entered into the world and uh, sin entered into the world and death uh, upon all men. So it was already there. There was already the fall of the first Adam before the last Adam came on the scene. So we understand and see, dear soul, that uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, the book of Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 14, For as much as the children 
are partakers of flesh and blood. The elect peoples of God, chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world, they are partakers of flesh and blood. For as much then as that's the case, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same. They are flesh and blood, so he becomes incarnate. He becomes flesh and blood. He was born of a woman, made of a woman, born under the law. He came into the world and death was already upon him. I believe our brother read you Romans chapter uh, 8 and verse number 3. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You need to think about that. How was the perfection of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, to be seen in the likeness of sinful flesh? He had to be like us. He had to enter into this death with us. And the Bible said, He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It is only as the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is legally constituted and made responsible for man's sin that he can bring to man God's righteousness. For he hath made him, he God the Father, hath made him God the Son to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The law couldn't do that. The law can say, thou shalt, and we have to say, well, I didn't. The law can say, thou shalt not, but we said, I'm sorry, Lord, I did. I broke the law. It can tell you that you are out of relationship with God, but it can't change that relationship. None but the person of the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. So prior to Moses' birth, a death sentence was already upon him and there was a place of execution. Cast them into the river. Well, in a minute we're going to look and see that's where Moses' mother put him, into the river. Isn't that amazing? So here we see that there was that place of execution that Pharaoh, picturing Satan, had already blanketed the uh, humanity uh, uh, with. They were already uh, prone to die. They come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Let's finish our verse in Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why did he do that? That, here it is, in order that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Not only did Jesus Christ come into the world as a human being, but he waited and the time was the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4. 4. The fullness of time. When was that? After man had sinned and Satan had stole the scepter and the crown off of Adam's head and out of his hand. And he became uh, uh, the power of death. He had the power of death that is the devil. Then and only then did Moses get placed into the river that was supposed to be the place of execution. Then and only then did the Lord Jesus Christ get brought forth because he would, through death, do two things. Destroy him that had previously the power of death, that is the devil, and number two, deliver them who through fear of that death, eternal death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For he took not 
hold upon him the uh, fallen angels, but he took upon him the responsibility to redeem the seed of Abraham. He didn't come to save angels. He came to save, it says, the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He came to partake of the children. He came in verse 17 to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So death preceded the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is pictured here by uh, the, the, the chapter starts off with, after we read that horrible verse in chapter 1 and verse 22, that Pharaoh says, throw all the newborn male children into the river. What a horrible thing to do. A little baby hadn't really got used to breathing in atmosphere, air, oxygen. Hadn't hardly taken many breaths in life, and he would cast them into the water so that they might ingest that water into their lungs, breathe that in, and breathe in death. That's when Moses was brought forth. It was a blanket uh, commandment from Pharaoh. I don't care what they look like, how many pounds they weigh, who was their mother, who was their daddy. If they are a male Hebrew, cast them into the river. And then we begin to see that it was not only a place of execution, but it was a place of preservation. That's where his mother put him. And we would like to say, Mr. Pharaoh, you need to understand something. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye mete out, it shall be measured to you again. You are setting up your own judgment. God is going to judge you by that which you have determined as the measure of judgment and what it should be. We have to be careful in our life, dear soul, because that which we do to others, he said, it is as you do that unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So be careful how you deal with others because that's you measuring out the yardstick to hand to God and say, here's how I want you to measure me. So I want you to understand something, Mr. Pharaoh. With what judgment you judge, it shall be measured to you again. And we go over to Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 22, and we read this. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God said, tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son. Next verse. And I say unto thee, I, God, say unto thee, Pharaoh, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, listen, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So here is God being very plain to Pharaoh and said, you started this. You are killing my uh, firstborn, Israel. All the male babies that are born of the Hebrew women, you have a command, a blanket command, and nobody would be, uh, would be arrested for attempted murder or for murder. Egyptians can kill uh, Israelites at, at their will, freely, without any uh, fear of retribution. There was going to be no sheriff come to their house and say, several people saw you cast an infant baby into the Nile River. You're under arrest for murder. No. 
Pharaoh said, Anybody that can find a male Hebrew child, throw them in the river that they die. I said, okay. With what measure you just meted out, I'm going to take that ruler and measure it back to you again. And I'm going to tell you here in Exodus 4 and verse 23, if thou refuse to let my son go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy son. Firstborn. People don't believe it. Second Samuel chapter 22. People don't believe it. But we have been handed a bill of goods about the character and the person of God for so long, we don't realize who God is. We say God is love. And that's what the Bible said. God is love. But dear soul, how can you be love if you don't hate evil? If you don't hate evil, you don't really have love. You just, had, you just had sinful affections. That's not love. That's just serpy emotions. And in 2 Samuel chapter 22, beginning with verse number 26, it says, With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, thou, God, will show thyself up, upright. Verse 27. And with the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, that is the crooked, and the devious, thou wilt show thyself unsavory, that is cunning and shrewd. It is that which we measure out to God. That doesn't change him in his being. I am the Lord, I change not. But it brings forth that in his being which brings forth true justice. To one, God is showing himself uh, as merciful. And that's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans chapter 9, speaking of Pharaoh, I will be merciful unto whom I will be merciful and whom I will I harden. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart in order that God might show himself as shrewd and as devious as Pharaoh extended to him. Be careful, dear friend. You can't smite God Cain couldn't kill God so he killed Abel but then God said wait a minute I hear something he said, what is it I hear thy brother's blood crying to me from the ground we need to be careful how we deal with other people we need to make sure that our Christianity is not just lip service that I can memorize the books of the Bible and I can attend church and I'll be baptized and all that sort. But that there is that righteousness of God for my hearts that expresses itself in every situation to every person. When thou art, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When they smack you on one cheek, that's the reason God gave you a backup cheek. Turn it, let them smite it too. Do not return evil for evil. That's not how God dealt with you. That's not how God dealt with me. And we need to be careful how we deal with people because God will look at that and say, well, that's how you feel. That's not my spirit in you. That's the spirit maybe of religion. It was the scribes and Pharisees, highly religious, that demanded that Christ be put on the cross. The only perfect man there's ever been, the very son of God, and they envied him, they despised him, they rejected him, they hid their faces from him, and they demanded that the Roman government do that which they did not have the legal right to do, and that is execute a Jew. They were highly religious. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter. They were highly legalistically righteous. 
but not experientially and spiritually righteous. Be careful, dear friend. So here was Pharaoh setting forth at the very begin, very beginning the place of execution. Where was it? It was in the river. Now, as we drop down into chapter 2 of Exodus, the whole thing starts with a marriage. There went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. He married within his own tribe. And the Bible says not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And that doesn't just mean marriage. It's talking about any yoke of life. Be careful. And he says, and the woman conceived and bare a son. Verse 1, there's a marriage. Verse 2, there was a birth. That's how this, all thing, this whole thing happened. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, a most marvelous thing and talks about a great mystery. Oh boy, we're going to get to see some great mystery. It's, you know, this thing's been spooky and it's been weird and we've been wondering all about this and we're going to figure it out. It's something that's been with you all your life. You've seen it a million times. Listen, what is the great mystery? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians 5.25. The reason he did so was so that he might sanctify his church, his bride, and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. The preaching of the word of God is that which washes and makes pure the church. And that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now listen. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh because she's going to be bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. You and her are going to be one. So if, if you hate her, you're hating yourself. But nourished and cherished it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. Now listen. For this cause shall a man do two things. Number one, leave his father and mother and shall cleave, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Brother Gene, where's that great mystery? Okay, next verse. This man and woman, man treating his wife like Christ treats the church, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hadn't been talking about marriage. We haven't been meeting in the church basement every Thursday night for four weeks to counsel you on marriage. What we've been doing is showing you Christ and the church. And if you can see that, and husband, you need to represent Christ to that woman. And, and, and wife, you need to represent the church to that man. That's the great mystery. So here we have the great mystery presented to us. There is, first of all, an edict of death, a place of execution. Cast them into the river. Second thing, as we begin to look towards the place of preservation, it begins by marriage and a birth. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And it says uh, th that we are born of the Spirit. John 3, 3, 5, and 8. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. For the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound thereof. You can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. This thing is done by the Holy Spirit of God. Brother Tommy read us Titus 3.15, not by the washing of water of ourselves, 
but by the renewal, renewal of the Holy Ghost. God does it. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So the Spirit of God gave this marriage a blessed conception and a birth. No problem. Abraham's wife, Sarah, couldn't do it 14 years later. There was various women in the old economy, couldn't bring forth a child. But this, representing the person of the Lord Jesus so closely, verse 1, they got married. Verse 2, they had a baby. That's, it's that simple. God brought forth his son into the world. Now, it says that the reason that she did not allow him to fall under the edict of evil Pharaoh and have him exposed to be cast into the river was for one reason. He was a goodly child. I looked that word up, that word good, goodly, and in Isaiah 39 and verse 2, it's the same word, precious. You say, yeah, we all look at our children and our uh, newborn children and newborn grandchildren. We say, oh, how precious. But it means a whole lot more than that. This was somehow or other a placing of the Holy Spirit upon this child so that when you looked at him, there was something different about him than just looking upon the beauty of any other newborn child. This child was precious. Acts chapter 7, Stephen preached about this in his message before he was stoned to death. In Acts chapter 7, in verse number 20, we read, In which time Moses was born, and exceeding fair... And nourished up in his father's house three months. Moses was raised up in his father's house. Why? The Holy Spirit leads Stephen to bring it into his message. And this was a man whose face glowed so much when he preached. He looked like an angel that's, that was preaching. He was full of the Holy Spirit. There was a glow in his face. There was power in so much that these men could not bear it, gnashed on him with their teeth, and stoned him to death while he called on the Lord to forgive them as Christ did on the cross, for they know not what they do. And in that kind of message, not just some little sermonette, but the revelation of God in power through Stephen's message, he mentions that he was exceeding fair. That's how he came to be preserved and raised up in his father's house. Then the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, which we call the faith chapter, and verse number 23, by faith Moses, this is Hebrews eleven twenty-three. by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, listen, because they saw he was a proper child. There was something spiritually precious about him. There was something that was goodly about him to look upon him. God placed a different countenance upon him. Not just an ordinary baby, but one that was specially anointed with the goodness and the preciousness of God. He was a goodly child. He was a proper child. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Oh, my soul. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, 
looked full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. So to look upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will cause you to be able to, uh, to see him so that all the things of this earth will grow strangely dim as you look upon his blessedness. Everything else will fade away. There was a man down at the temple whose name was Simon. And he was one that waited on the consolation of Israel. And when they took him to, uh, to the temple, when Mary and Joseph took him to the temple, there was one Simon that was there. And she uh, let him be held by this man. Luke chapter 2, verse number 25. Had a time finding that one. Luke 2, 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon or Simon. The same man was just and devout. What, how did his being just and being devout manifest itself? Waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The mandate of death was upon this man physically. All, you know, it is appointed unto man once to die. Even if you're born again, child of God, we got to die physically. So he would not taste death, he would not see death until he saw the Lord's child. And he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. I'm not afraid of death anymore. Hebrews 11:23 said his parents were not afraid of the king's edict, his command anymore. Why? Because they looked into Moses' face and there was something different about him. This man, Simon, looked into the face of the infant Christ. Listen, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Listen at verse 30, Luke chapter 2 and verse 30. For mine eyes have seen this beautiful child. That's not what he said. This goodly countenance, that's not what he said. What did he say? This man had the Holy Ghost upon him. This man had the Holy Ghost revealing these things unto him. And with his anointed eyes, he says in Luke 2.30, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Similar to that, Moses' mom and dad looked in his face and they saw something different about this child. The doctors in the temple, when Jesus went up to the temple at 12 years of age, they'd never heard anybody of any age, especially young as he was, with such wisdom and knowledge as he had. And the child grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And Simon says to everybody around him in the temple, I am looking at not just a baby, oh, coochie, coochie, coo, what a cute baby. I know you're proud of him. You know, I know his grandparents must be going bonkers over him because, you know, he's such a pretty. He said, I've been waiting here to see the consolation of Israel. And now I am looking into the face of God's salvation. Isn't that amazing? This was different. It wasn't the same thing as somebody hanging around the nursery at the birthing center and looking at the children and saying, oh, how cute. There is that 
of this that shall affect you if you are a born again Christian. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Being that this is true, that there was something goodly, precious about this child of good countenance, more than just physical beauty. There was an understanding that this is the Lord. And it gave that man who had been waiting all that time, I don't know how long, the Bible doesn't say, who, who it, it gave that man finally a release and said, I don't have to hang around the physical temple anymore. I have seen God's spiritual temple. I have seen that this is the Lord God Almighty inside this body. He's inhabiting this temple. And I have seen God's salvation. And in that same way, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, I know something about us right now. Now are we the sons of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. I don't know what we're going to look like when we get over to the other side. But there's one thing I do know. It does not yet appear what we shall be. But I know this. When he shall appear. When the Son of God appears back to earth again. We shall be like him. Wait a minute. Why? Why? What are you basing that on? For we shall see him as he is. He that seeth the Son and believeth on him have life. For us to see the Lord Jesus Christ coming in his glory with all of his holy angels, when he comes back without any more forgiveness for a single sin and comes to bring us final and eternal salvation, when we shall see him, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, let's face another verse. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And verse number 2. Isaiah 53 and verse number 2. We need to make sure that we get not just out of our Bibles and out of our church buildings, paintings and pictures and images and statues of Jesus, but we need to get it out of our mind too. Because the Bible says looking at him in the physical only will not do this. You need to look at him through the spiritual realm. Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. There's no outward beauty. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You say, well, wait a minute. That's what we've been talking about, looking at Moses and Simon looking at Jesus and saying that there's something different about this. Yes, I'm still staying with that. But I'm telling you, it wasn't anything physical. It wasn't just saying, oh, pretty baby. It was a revelation of the glory of God that we see the, we have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So there, there's no outward beauty that we should behold him. It wasn't that he had a different look physically, but it was a different look spiritually. Let me read you something. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The love of Christ constrains us, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Because we thus judge, if he had to die for all of us, then all of us was dead. And that he died for all, that we should not henceforth from that point on, when he died for us and made application of his atonement to our lives, 
we should after that not live unto ourselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse, verse 16, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Chapter 4 and verse 18 of 2 Corinthians says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. And God has anointed our eyes that we might see the beauty of his Christ. Not a picture of, you know, the 12-year-old standing there with a white gown thing on with a golden girdle and curly black hair. And, and sometimes they put a big old metal, I mean, big old golden plate over his head representing a halo and say, well, that's Jesus. That won't get you into heaven. That'll get you into hell. You're going to have to see the beauty of Christ through the eye of the Spirit. So he was put into the same water that Pharaoh had designated as a place of execution as a place of preservation. And she did this with, uh, there was some plans that had already gone before. You know, when I buy anything, which I try not to, that needs to be assembled, I hate all those directions. But without them, you wouldn't know how to put it together. This woman has some directions. The Bible said in Ephesians, not Ephesians, Exodus chapter 2, verse 3, when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. There was a pattern. We go back to chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. And it says in verse 14, God speaking to Noah, Make thee an ark. That's what she made, an ark. He says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. That's exactly what she did. This had already been brought forth as how to save alive God's people even in a day when only uh, their imaginations were only evil continually. Here it was, there was nothing but death and destruction and the uh, order of execution upon this precious little life. And this little life would not only just be precious because he was a baby then, but he shall be Moses, the deliverer of God's people that shall walk out of Egypt with Israel. So we see she did that which was described to her. Hebrews eleven seven, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. That's what she did. She had the directions of ancient Israel wherein Noah was given the commandment of God to prepare an ark to put pitch, tar, whatever it was, inside and out to keep it from leaking and that would save Noah's house and condemn the whole world. She did the same thing. They're told you can't go wrong by following the ancient commands of Christ. Go thy way down by the footsteps of the flock. Find your way down to the shepherd's tent. Follow the Lord Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's what she did. And so the place of execution became the place of preservation. Our time is gone. Lord willing, and I mean that. That's not just something I say because... It sounds religious, but Lord willing, we shall take up here in the second lesson. God bless you. Thank you for allowing us to come and bring this message to you. We pray for you. I trust you will remember us as well. Mm -hmm.